Okay, so I will start with the second part. So now switch of topic completely. Um, so actually this talk is about uh, video object segmentation, but I want to motivate a little bit why we're doing this and what is the end goal um, of, of some of the research that we also do in my group and a lot of research that is done in the community. And that is actually um, the, the goal of dynamics in understanding. So uh, in dynamics in understanding, we want to basically understand every pixel of a video. And so what I mean by that is we observe um, any dynamic scene with a camera. And now what we want to do is uh, we want to, for example, assign semantic classes to each of the pixels in a video. So we want to know which pixels belong to a person, tree, car, etc. cetera. Um, so this is the task of semantic segmentation, and you will hear about this in the, in the following days. Um, but this is, not, um, this is not the end story, right? So we not only want to know which pixels belong to the class person, but we also want to identify each of the persons. So we want to know which pixels belong to person one, person two, three, et cetera. Um, so this is the, the task of instance-based segmentation that you will also hear about. And finally, um, I've been talking only uh, about an image, but we want to do this also in time. So we want to um, not only have um, pixel-wise information per image, but for a video. So we want to um, perform the task of multiple object tracking. So I will talk about this next week, uh, but today I want to focus a bit more on the segmentation part. Not semantic segmentation, but only segmentation. So kind of going um, to a more simple problem. And in particular, um, I want to explain how one can perform video object segmentation without temporal information, which seems kind of counterintuitive, but actually it, it works surprisingly well. Um, so for this task, we will focus on um, supervised video object segmentation. And so what I mean by that is that um, we have the first image of our video uh, with the ground truth mask of the object that we want to follow. And so we know how it looks like, we know um, the shape in this first mask. And now our task is essentially to follow this object through the video and so to segment this object through the video. And this is easy um, in the first frames when you actually see the object fully, but it gets a bit harder when, for example, the object is completely occluded or partially occluded or changes the appearance. Um, so there are tons of classic methods on how to do this, um, ranging from using uh, optical flow to using some sort of, of graph structure, um, CRFs, MRFs. Uh, but we're going to do a much more simple thing um, and that is we're going to actually use neural networks to directly predict the segmentation mask. Um, so the architecture is actually very simple. So you take your um, input image and you create a series of convolutions and pulling, um, convolutions and pulling filters um, to get um, kind of a, this smaller cube with far more channels. So this is the classic, um, could be the classic AlexNet, uh, VGG architecture. You just take a big chunk of this. Then what we do is um, we actually upsample all these um, tiny cubes to the original size of the image, and we sum them up to make the final prediction. So of course there's going to be um, some um, some one by one convolutions in the end, so that you can use any size of the image. But this is a pretty much um, standard network, so no need to worry about this part. Now. Um, the interesting thing is that um, we're going to use um, also uh, a contour network. So a network that is actually um, has the same structure, but is, has now been trained to predict the contours of the image, so the edges of the image. And with this, we can actually improve our segmentation. So you will see that, for example, here, uh, there might be some holes in the middle of, the, um, of this, um, of this person, uh, this person on a car, and this could be easily filled. So how we do it is um, we actually have this neural network that predicts the edges, we can compute super pixels that match these edges, and now we can do what we call uh, boundary snapping. So essentially we take the super pixels, we look at how many of the pixels inside the super pixels are actually white from our train network, and then we say, well, these super pixels should be either all white or all black, with a threshold of 50% in our case. So like this, you get kind of smoother results. 
Okay, so this is the, um, this is the basic architecture. Uh, but now the really interesting thing is how do you actually train this architecture for the task of video object segmentation? Now, I have said that, um, that we, do, um, we can use something like AlexNet VGG pre-trained on, um, on ImageNet. So this is always the starting point. And if you actually take your test image and you now run um, this, um, this base network, we, ha we still haven't done anything with this network. We just took the, the weights and we, we passed the test image on these weights. Uh, we can see that it actually extracts these, um, these uh, green points. So this should be the predicted mask. And these are actually basically these edges and basic image features that we want to obtain from, uh, from such convolutional filters. Now, um, of course, this network still doesn't know how to perform video object segmentation. <coughs> so in a second step, uh, we take um, the Davis data set, which um, was actually created by someone who did the PhD here, Jordi, you pro maybe some of you know it. Um, so it's actually a really, really accurate segmentation data set. Uh, like the masks that are provided are really crazily accurate in the terms <coughs> of hair of people and, and this kind of pixel-wise accuracy. And so what we can do is we can take all the training sequences from this data set and just train our network. So this is the first active training that we're doing. And so we're teaching the network to do video segmentation. But video segmentation is, a, is quite a general task. So in these data sets, um, there are buses, there are bears, there's people, and all of these are objects to be segmented. So effectively, the only thing that the network can learn at this point is um, to segment something like foreground, which can be anything, in this case it takes the people, from background, which is building. Uh, but this is not exactly what we want. We actually want to segment one particular object within this crowd of people. And this particular object is actually uh, the person that is breakdancing in this sequence. And so um, since this is supervised video object segmentation, we can provide the first mask, the first ground truth mask. So this uh, looks like this black and white image. And we actually fine tune the network with this first mask. And by fine tuning, I mean that the network is heavily overfitting to this particular object. So it's learning the appearance of this particular object and learning that everything else is actually background. And so by um, proposing these three training steps, we have actually gone from uh, a network that extracts edges and image features to a network that does video object segmentation to a network that is now overfitted to the object that we want to follow throughout the video. Um, so it is important to note that this network is learning the appearance of the foreground, but also of the background objects. And so if um, the person or if the object that we're trying to, to track actually changes the pose too much, or if a background object becomes an occluded, then things are, going to, um, are not going to work so well. And I will show this later. Uh, but first, um, since we're talking about um, this kind of three-step training, the question is how much should we actually fine-tune the network? So can we fine-tune too much? Can we fine-tune too little? So um, what we can show here is, um, so this is essentially a plot of um, the time that we spend um, fine-tuning per each frame, um, plus uh, uh, compared to the um, region of similarity, which is basically the measure used to say how good our segmentation is. So the starting point is our parent network. So our parent network takes 102 milliseconds to give an answer of the, uh, of the mask. So this is just the, the, uh, the forward pass of the network. And now what we're going to do is uh, we plot these curves. So the blue one and um, the, um, the white one which are um, what happens to accuracy if you actually spend more and more time fine tuning to this first frame. So of course, um, the accuracy of your segmentation is going to improve. And it reaches a point where you cannot learn more from this first mask, so it makes no sense um, to fine tune more. But what you can see essentially is that if you actually spend just one second per frame, which is relatively not a lot, 
Um, we actually outperformed the best method at the time, which was based on, uh, on optical flow and optical flow of particular objects. And so we could outperform it by uh, almost 12 percentage points. So this was actually a huge boost, considering that we have just taken a network, uh, trained it for video segmentation, and then fine tuned it for this particular object. So this is one way that you can actually um, take advantage of the overfitting of, uh, of neural networks. And so let's see some, um, some funny experiments. So one thing that works really poorly uh, for classic video object segmentation methods um, is actually um, heavy occlusions. So in this case, we have this biker. The first mask is depicted in red. And uh, this biker goes through a series of occlusions. And by occlusions, I mean uh, there are these trees. I mean, there's quite a lot of motion blur also in the video. But there are these trees with the, with the branches. And this kind of throw off segmentation uh, that is based on some kind of temporal information, it just throws it off completely. And we can see that um, even if behind the occlusion we're missing some parts, we still recover the object pretty well after the occlusion. And the same can be shown for the second occlusion, where we get this really bad patch here. But then, since it's frame by frame, um, it just recovers decently well after the occlusion. Um, now, a funny thing is the, is the, um, the camel problem, the two camel problem, um, in which we found that, um, so in this video, there is this camel that is segmented, and you're supposed to follow it through the video. But then suddenly appears another camel, which looks exactly the same. And so of course, the segmentation says, well, this is also a camel, right? So I should also segment it. So the question is, if you have really similar objects, and you can see that this object was occluded before, how can we actually deal with this? Well, um, it is very simple to actually use more annotations with the method, because you don't just fine tune to the first frame, but you fine tune to um, the number of frames that you need to make your, um, your segmentation accurate. So um, in the first frame where we see um, that there is actually um, some, um, so that the mask is going to the other camel, we immediately annotate this particular frame. And we say, no, look, this part here on the left is not really my camel. Um, now, if you do this iteratively, so if you just pick the, um, the images where the segmentation is actually worse, then you can improve your camel segmentation up to a point where the sec second camel is considered as background and only your forward camel is considered as foreground. So we, by just using three annotations in this case, we could fix completely the segmentation of the second camel. And of course, this is, um, there's no temporal information, right? So there's no um, error propagation. There's no drift. So we can do um, segmentation on really hard scenes, um, for example, highly dynamic scenes, where um, typically um, the car is lost after the first turn because there's just too much smoke and algorithms cannot handle it. And also here, there is uh, a bunch of splashes and three thin structures. And so it's quite a, quite a hard scene for video object segmentation methods. Um, now, one thing that, that we haven't dealt with is actually um, the shape of the objects, right? So objects um, do have a shape, and we know a typical shape, for example, for a car. Uh, but the network that we're using doesn't have any notion of the actual object. So you, it's very common to see something like uh, broken contours. And um, when occluded parts become visible, then they are also segmented as, as foreground. So what we would ideally like is we would like to have some sort of a notion of objects. So it would say, well, if you think that this is mostly a foreground mask and we know it's a car, then just fill in the rest of the segmentation mask. And this can be particularly important in cases like this, where uh, we have our first mask, which is this perfectly segmented uh, person doing break dancing. But of course, this guy is going to move a lot. So as soon as we go to another frame, what happens is that the guy in the background, which was occluded before, is now detected as foreground. So the network, of course, has not seen at all that this is actually background. So either we add one annotation or we fix it through semantics. 
Now the same thing happens to um, some parts of the person break dancing. So we have not seen, the person <coughs> is, is turning quite fast, so we have not seen the back of this person. So as soon as we have a frame where there's the back of this person, we have never learned this appearance. So um, the, the network is just going to consider it as background. So in order to fix uh, both things, what we proposed in a follow-up paper was um, to actually add one more path to our network. So the original path was um, the OSVOS path, um, OSVOS for um, one-shot um, video object segmentation. And this is the one that actually learns um, the appearance of the object from the first frame. So the, what I've explained up to now. Um, and what we want to add is actually we want to add this segmentation path, which goes uh, at the top. And this is going to give us uh, a certain series of proposals. So here we can use uh, Marscar CNN or any algorithm that gives proposals with a semantic class. And so, for example, it's going to say, well, here there's um, a motorbike, which looks like this. It's the green pixels. Um, then there's the rider, which are the yellow pixels. Then there's a car, which are the red pixels, etc., etc. And so what we will do is we will go to our appearance model and we will choose the proposals that best overlap with our appearance model, with the mask given by our appearance model. And we can do this in the first frame where we have the really ground truth mask and then know that what we want to follow is actually a rider and the motorbike and use this information for the rest of the frames in order to correctly um, segment this, um, this object. Um, so the important thing is, uh, first of all, how do we generate instance proposals? But there are a lot of good methods for that, so we don't care too much about that. And the other thing is the semantic selection and propagation. So of course, this, um, this needs to be based on the first frame so that we don't start propagating wrong information. Um, and so what we can say now is that we have built uh, a model that enforces that semantics stay coherent throughout the sequence. So we don't have any temporal information, but we know uh, that semantics don't change throughout the sequence. So this is something that we can use. And so how... Um, how it works visually is um, we have all our image uh, segmentation proposals. So each and every one of the motorbikes is uh, one possible object. Uh, we have the ground truth from the first mask. So we can now say, OK, I, I'm going to follow this person and this motorbike. And so for the next frames, you can obtain a different set of proposals. You can obtain your mask. And this is the result, which is, yeah, it's still a motorbike, and it's still a person, and it overlaps with my appearance model. So these are the two um, proposals that I'm going to plot as a result. And you can see that uh, as the sequence goes on, um, our appearance model, so um, the, the method that I've presented before, degrades, because um, there's too much viewpoint change in this, uh, in this sequence. And so the network has not learned properly the appearance of the side of the motorbike, for example. But of course, if we know um, that we're still tracking one person and one motorbike, we can just fill this information uh, with the instance proposals that are given by Mascar CNN or any of the methods. OK, so just a bit of, uh, of numbers to, um, to finish. So. Um, the, the most inter interesting numbers actually are um, how each of the pieces that I've explained helps to improve the task of video object segmentation. So if you just focus on the top row, which is um, the, the mean value that we actually care about, uh, we see the first one, um, this is ImageNet. So this is taking VGG directly, no training on video segmentation data. Um, one shot means the, uh, the fact that you are fine tuning on the first mask. So this actually improves quite a lot, of course. I mean, you're giving a lot of information on which object to follow. Um, if we further put um, the, the pre-training on the parent network, so now the two steps are combined. So first, you train your network for general video object segmentation, and then you fine tune it to the specific object. Then you improve um, actually 12 percentage points. Um, semantic information is actually giving us also a really huge boost. 
And it gives especially a boost also in temporal stability. So in the last row here, um, it is plotted um, something like temporal stability, where the lower the number, the better it is. So we can see that um, compared to um, classic fine tuning or even fine tuning plus the parent, um, if we use semantic information, of course, you have a really strong prior on which objects to follow and where they should be and the, the close contour. So you don't need to have so much good uh, first. So the network does not need to learn so much the appearance of the object because the rest is just going to be filled by these proposals. And so temporal stability is actually much, much higher. And the rest, um, the other two columns just improve a bit. They are this uh, boundary snapping that I've explained in the beginning, so using essentially super pixel information. So this actually was really helpful for the first case where we didn't have semantics. Of course, when you have semantics and so full contours, this is less important. Okay, so um, just to conclude the, um, the talk on, on video object segmentation, um, we were actually also surprised to see that we can do a pretty good job in obtaining um, consistent segmentations, even without temporal information. Um, so I did my PhD in multiple object tracking, so I'm really focused on um, the temporal part, the motion, um, coherent motion, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I was a bit sad to see that you don't really need all this to obtain coherent segmentations. But this is just because you are giving the network a really strong appearance uh, information that it, you know, networks are really good at learning these type of things. So this is essentially what we're exploiting here. Now, uh, of course, the, the method suffers under uh, post changes or, or occluded objects that become suddenly visible. Uh, but for this, we can actually use semantic priors that can give us this um, object type uh, segmentation, so full objects. And so we can do a much better work in, in, um, in keeping these segmentations consistent with these semantic priors. Okay, so that um, if you have any questions uh, from this part,